Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is titled The Role of the Anterior Hip Capsule in Daily Hip Performance. My name is Christopher Iverson, and I work here at Anybody Technology. Today, I will be the host of this webinar, and I'll be joined by my colleague Bjorn Keller Inglund, who is one of our research and development engineers here at Anybody. Bjorn will join us during the Q&A session and help us out with answering your questions. In today's webcast, we have an external speaker who is doctoral researcher, Kate Dukresny. And Kate works at the Department of Human Structure and Repair at the Ghent University in Belgium. In today's webcast, she will share insights from a study on the role of the anterior hip capsule in daily hip performance, which was recently published in Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine. And I have highlighted the reference here if you want to go and check it out after the webcast. The presentation will start in a few minutes or so, but just before we start, I'll give you a general introduction and overview of the Anybody modeling system. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the software or musculoskeletal modeling and simulations in general. First of all, I would like to point your attention to the control panel, which appears on the right side of your screen. You are very welcome to submit your questions and comments via the questions panel during the presentation and we will try to address the questions in the very end of this webinar. In case we do not get to answer all of your questions, we will try to do so by email within a reasonable time. So let's begin with having a look at what the Anybody Modeling System actually is. But the Anybody Modeling System is a software that allows you to do musculoskeletal modeling and simulations. As input, it takes motion data as kinematics and forces, and it calculates the internal body loads as joint moments, joint reaction forces, and muscle forces. And down here in the bottom of the screen, you can see an actual screenshot from the software. So this can give you an idea of how, how the system looks. At the moment, anybody is used in a wide variety of areas and applications. And a few examples of this is movement analysis, product optimization design, the field of sports optimization, ergonomics, orthopedics and rehabilitation, and assistive devices as, for example, an exoskeleton. And the typical workflow in anybody could look something like this. So you provide the recorded motion data as input, and you can then use the body models which you or others have built. And then you can provide some kind of environment which could be a special type of equipment or, for example, an exoskeleton. Then you can use anybody to combine all of these things and solve the muscle recruitment and run the inverse dynamic simulations. This basically means that we go from motion to calculate the internal body loads and the interaction with the environment in some cases. And it gives us an, an simulation that looks something like this. You can then go ahead and output the results and use it for some kind of post-processing, which could be a finite element tool. But many users also choose to complete this loop by doing some kind of design optimization and then run this cycle multiple times. And this actually brings me to the end of the introduction. And I'll go ahead and hand over the word and present the role to Kate instead. Thank you for the nice introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me start this presentation with an interesting fact. The iliofemoral ligament is the strongest ligament in our body. Nevertheless, in literature, it is said to only have a passive stabilizing function. Isn't this a bit strange? Why would this ligament be so strong if it only serves as an emergency break for occasional hip hyperextension trauma? That was actually the starting point of our investigation. But before diving into the details, I'll give a short introduction and explain what exactly our aim was. Then I'll elaborate on how we did our investigation and how we implemented our model in the anybody modeling system. Finally, I'll explain the relevance of our findings. But first things first, let me start with a bit of anatomy. The hip capsule is reinforced with three main ligaments. The pubofemoral ligament at the inferior side of the hip joint. The ischiofemoral ligament is located at the posterior side. And lastly, the iliofemoral ligament covers the superior and anterior side of the hip capsule. As mentioned before, the iliofemoral ligament is the main focus of this study. I'll also sometimes shorten it to IFL. The IFL is a Y-shaped ligament that arises from the anterior inferior iliac spine 
and splits into two parts. While the superior part runs parallel to the femoral neck, the inferior portion is a bit twisted and ends at the intertrochantic line. As mentioned before, the IFL is the strongest ligament of the body. It can withstand forces up to 350 newton. This failure strength is a lot higher than the strength of the other two hip capsule ligaments. In addition, the IFL stiffness is way higher than the stiffness of the pubofemoral and ischiofemoral ligaments. Nevertheless, literature mainly focuses on the passive joint stabilizing properties of the IFL. If we look more closely to the muscles around the hip, we can see something interesting. The IFL shares its moment arm with the iliopsoas, the most important hip flexor. This is captivating, as we know that a ligament acts like a spring. When springs are extended, potential energy is stored in the spring. When the spring is released again, the potential energy is released as well. For the IFL, this means that when the hip is extended, potential energy is stored in the IFL. When the leg is brought back forward, the energy can be released again. Therefore, our hypothesis was that the IFL helps the hip flexors to bring the leg forward, or thus that the IFL reduces the workload of the hip flexors during gait. In this study, we aim to define the contribution of the iliofemoral ligament to human walking. Or thus, we wanted to determine whether the IFL reduces the workload of the hip flexors during walking. So, how did we investigate this? We simulated the human gait with and without the inclusion of the IFL. We then studied the effect of including the IFL on the required muscle work of the hip musculature. To do so, we used the data set of Schreiber and Weissene of 2019. This data set comprises the human gait of 50 healthy individuals with ages between 19 and 67 years. The data set also included other physical parameters such as length and loss. We selected three straight level walking trials for each subject. In these trials, the subjects walked at speeds between 2.9 and 4.3 kilometers per hour. We simulated their walking trials in the anybody modeling system. To do so, we used the standard bone topology, which is the Twente Lower Extremity Model version 2.1. And we also used the three element hill type muscles. We scaled the models with the standard length mass fat scaling law. Of course, important for our study was the implementation of the iliofemoral ligament. We modeled the superior and inferior parts separately. For each part, we used two springs. So we used a total of four springs to model the iliofemoral ligament. This is illustrated at the right side of the slide with the four black lines. We defined the origins and insertions based on the work of Tsutsumi and his colleagues in 2020. To make sure that the ligaments do not intersect with the acetabular rim or the femoral neck, we used an ellipsoid wrapping surface. Then, of course, we also needed to define the mechanical properties. We implemented a linear force displacement relationship with properties based on what Hewitt and his colleagues reported in 2002. We scaled these strengths together with the strength scaling of the pelvic muscles. To obtain accurate forces in the ligament, we also needed to calibrate the ligaments. We opted to calibrate the ligament rest length using the neutral standing position of the static trials of the subject. Furthermore, there is a large uncertainty on the mechanical properties of the iliofemoral ligament. Therefore, we also included a parameter study in which we decreased the strength of the ligament to 25 50 and 75 percentage of the mean strength found by Hewitt and his colleagues. After, crea after the creation of our model, um, we ran the kinematic and inverse dynamic study. 
I'll illustrate that with two short movies. On the left side, you will see a side view, and on the right side, you can see a frontal view. The movie starts with the right leg in extension and the left leg in flexion. So this means that at the start point, the right IFL is extended and the left IFL is relaxed. During the movie, the right leg will be brought forward, or does the right IFL will relax and, re and return its stored energy. In contrast, the left leg will go from flexion to extension, or does the ligaments will become elongated and thus store energy. We'll let it play one more time. Okay, so after running the inverse dynamic study, we studied the mechanical work of the muscle groups around the hip joint. For an easy comparison, we defined a ratio R. This is the ratio between the required muscle work for a muscle group when the IFL was present in the simulation and the required mu muscle work for a muscle group when the IFL was not present in the simulation. This means that if this ratio is larger than one, more work is required from this muscle group when the IFL is included. If this ratio is smaller than one, this means that less work is required from a muscle group when the IFL is included. On the right side of the slide, I plotted box plots for four different muscle groups. At the upper left, you find the gluteal muscles. At the upper right, you find the results for the quadriceps, lower left for the iliopsoas, and lower right for the sartorius. On the x-axis, I plotted the parameter study. So the 100 percentage indicates that we used the mean strength found by Hewitt and his colleagues. The more you move to the left, the weaker the implemented IFL uh, gets. So we have the 25, 50 and 75 percentage um, strength uh, cases. What you can clearly see from these figures is that for the iliopsoas, the workload is significantly reduced in all strength cases. The same accounts for the sartorius, except for the 25 percentage strength case. For the other two muscle groups, the effect is less significant. But what, is, what does this now mean? What implications does this have? First of all, these findings have a clinical relevance. Currently, in hip arthroscopy, there is no consensus on capsular management. In literature, you can find evidence that closing the hip capsule after arthroscopy improves stability. Further, Economopoulos and his colleagues found in a prospective randomized trial that there are better patient-reported outcomes when the anterior hip capsule was repaired. Our study adds to this that the IFL works synergistically with the hip musculature and that therefore repairing the capsule seems the most appropriate thing to do. Next, similar to hip arthroscopy, in arthroplasty, in arthroplasty there is no consensus in capsular management. And we could also find conflicting reports in literature. Again, from a mechanical standpoint, repairing the capsule seems the right thing to do. Our findings also have implications for research. If one wants to study the workload of the hip flexors for motions where the hip is extended, I would recommend to include the anterior capsular ligaments, as these may alter your results. And lastly, this knowledge can be and has already been used in exoskeleton research. Similar to the IFL, passive spring-like structures can store and return energy during cyclic movements. Implementing these in an exoskeleton may thus reduce the energetic cost of locomotion. One study of 2020 implemented a spring anteri anteriorly across the hip joint in an exoskeleton. They found that the participants' contribution to hip power for hip flexion was reduced with 23%. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and if, you, if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Kate.
I think it was a very interesting presentation, and uh, I would just like to say a few words before we go to the Q&A session. So if you want to know more about Anybody Technology and our software, you can go and check out our website at anybodytech.com, where you can find different events, special dates, previous webcasts, and also a full publication list of studies using the Anybody modeling system. You can also go and check out anyscript.org, which is our community website for people using Anybody. And here you will find multiple online resources as our wiki page, several blog posts, and links to our repository sites. It's also here our forum is located, and you can go and ask questions and get help from some fellow Anybody users. I would also like to announce the recent release of the Anybody Modeling System version 7.4. This version was released on May 2nd, so only a few days ago, and is now available on our website. And if you are interested in trying it out, then you can go and request a trial license for the system. And the main new model highlights of this version are several new examples of exoskeletons and environment interactions. And there's also a tool for applying femoral torsion to the trended lower extremity model. And most of the example models now also include a very convenient tool for creating high quality videos of the model with a single operation. And besides these additions, the new model repository also includes a host of new model improvements to all of the body parts and many bug fixes to problems discovered since the last release. We will release a webcast in the beginning of June where you can see all of these new features and listen what else have been, is in the pipeline for anybody. And the registration for this webcast will be live on our website shortly. Last but not least, if you have any questions or you want to meet up with us or you're just interested in getting a trial version of the software, then please feel free to send us an email at sales at anybodytech.com. And if you have any follow-up questions regarding this webcast or any of the previous ones, then please feel free to send me an email at kai at anybodytech.com or reach out to me through LinkedIn. I think this brings us to the Q&A session and uh, I would just like to thank you for your attention this far.